thank you for joining us. Of course, uh, we're always available here, not just this evening, streaming live, but we are around once this finishes. It will be on YouTube and, of course, the audio version of the podcast will be up on iTunes and Spotify and other podcast providers. Uh, we've got a Q&A coming up this evening. Uh, Hi-fi, hardware, movie questions, uh, anything you want to ask, um, then you can do that in the chat window and we'll get round to that round about halfway through the podcast. Uh, we are also discussing the best and worst of Hugh Jackman at the end of the show, as voted for by our patrons. And please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, so you get these podcasts when they go out. You become a subscriber. It helps our channel. Uh, most importantly, hit the like button. Uh, that definitely helps... Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, messages turning up all over the screen at the minute. Um, so yeah, it, if you subscribe, if you like the video, it's really important. It helps us. It gets it up on the search, uh, makes it easy to find. And like I say, we are on Patreon. Uh, if you'd like to join us as a patron, uh, then you can join us at patreon.com forward slash AV forums. Uh, it's three pounds per month. Uh, it would be great to see you on here as a patron. Uh, it's growing every week and that's great to see. Uh, also, if you just want to make a one-off donation and ask a question, it's probably the best way to get your question answered. Uh, then you can donate directly to us at streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. And donations are gratefully received. If you feel inclined to support us, uh, you will be contributing directly towards growing AV forums, improving the site speed and features, uh, helping us produce more editorial content like news and reviews, and of course, publishing more and better videos and podcasts. Uh, if you are supporting us at the moment and your names will turn up on the right-hand side, those who have donated recently, thank you very much for your support. And before we go on any further as well, we have a special podcast on Tuesday night, uh, this Tuesday coming, the 20th first at 7 p.m it will go out as a live stream but of course you can watch it at any time once the stream finishes and there will be also an audio version that goes out our guests on this special uh, podcast uh, is uh, phil jones oliver crete and uh, roger bachelor um, from Denon and Sound United. Uh, we'll be talking about the Denon product launch, uh, all the details that are coming out from Denon, as well as a technical talk around uh, HDMI 2.1, 4K 120, 8K 60, uh, DTSX Pro Sound, and lots more. And obviously, we will also answer your questions, and the guys from Denon will answer your questions as well. If you put them in the chat window, if it goes live, if you want to get your questions in early, you can do it on the podcast thread underneath this podcast, or send them to podcast at avforums.com via email. Right, so we are caught up with all the uh, housekeeping. Time to go to competitions and cars. Yep, you can win a copy of Vagrant Queen Season 1 on Blu-ray. That closes 4th of August. Dark Waters on DVD, 28th of July. Criterion's July titles, which include Female Trouble, The Cameraman, and Three Outlaw Samurai, all on Blu-ray. That closes 4th of August. Win a copy of Invisible Man on 4K. That closes 28th of July. Crisscross on Blu-ray, 21st of July. Uh, Pennyworth, the complete first season on Blu-ray, closes 14th of August. The last waltz on Blu-ray closes. Ooh, it's closed already. And uh, Laughter in Paradise on Blu-ray closes 21st of July. We're also doing the podcast competition at the end, so stay tuned for that. All competitions open to eligible AV Forms members resident in the UK. Any previous competition winners, Cass? Yeah, we've got a whole host. Academic Ooh. Barzo won copies of Criterion's June titles on Blu-ray including Husbands, Dance Girl, Dance, and Scorsese shorts. Pit Stop Guido won uh, the podcast-exclusive Father's Day bundle of Bad Boys 3, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Blade Runner 2049 on Blu-ray. Lozzle 77 won a copy of Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood on Blu-ray. Primetime won a copy of Greed on Blu-ray. And Aaron Milne won a copy of Doolittle on Blu-ray. Excellent. Uh, well done if you won a competition. If you want to win, uh, lots of on AV Forums, go and search them out, avforums.com forward slash competitions. Um, Simon says in the chat, nice haircut, Ed. Mm -hmm. Well, it had to be done. Um, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, Phil was saying before we went online, I mean, you didn't realise uh, that how much I have taken off when I have a haircut. I don't have a haircut very often. I mean, I've been known to go six months between haircuts, but when I do actually go in and have a haircut, I have quite a lot of hair taken off. Um, believe it or not, this is less hair than I used to have taken off. It used to be a four on the top and two on the sides, but now I'm old 
Um, I've doubled that to an eight on the top and four on the sides. But it will now be... Number one all over. Uh, I'll wait until I've got close to your... Um, uh, level of uh, hair management, Steve, before well, I, I, I hit that level. Number but... one all over, but look, I've still got... Uh, oh, look, that's here. Well, but... I, I'll take that under advisement. I'm happy enough with how it goes for the moment. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But, um, yeah, that's uh, where we are at the moment. Um, that was done on the Tuesday. So you can now just watch it grow out for, I don't know, a couple of months. See how we go. Excellent. Why are you sitting in the ring of fire? Well, um, I uh, was in Tesco's and I saw that they were selling something called an Armageddon chili. Singular. <laughs> I thought, well, that looks fun. So I yesterday... I think you know where this story's going. <laughs> yesterday, I cooked a very large beef chili on my barbecue. Took seven hours. Um, I thought, well, one of them, you know, that's going to disseminate nicely amongst, you know, well over, getting on for three kilos worth of food. It's it's pretty lively. I'm not going to lie. And um, yeah, this morning at uh, six thirty, it's like ooh, ooh, I could do with going to the loo. So uh, yes, um, it's been a, a day punctuated by periodic <laughs> needs to pop to the loo. Um, and I do have quite a lot of this left to eat. So um, yeah, uh, that's um, it, it, it. It's a learning experience. It's not. Actually, what's weird is that some years ago, Tesco was selling Carolina Reapers, and they're supposed to be the hottest of the lot. And I actually, I made a beef brisket chili with one of those. And that was lively, but I would argue not quite as vicious as this one was. So, um, yeah, make of that what you will. Um, I'll still eat the rest of it. I'll just buy more sour cream. It'll be fine. <laughs> you can't accuse them of underselling it, can you, really? No, no, no. As I was say, it, it, what is life without experiments of this nature? So, yeah, it's, it's good. But it's been a week of experiments. This week, gentlemen, I have, in one calendar week, I have watched two films. Two. What? What? It's what more than the whole of last year. Exactly. Uh, I watched Greyhound on uh, Monday night. And? And? Midway. And then I watched Midway because it appeared on Amazon. Uh, I mean, I've, I know you've seen it. It's like a new film. But yeah, I what noticed... did you think of them? What did you think of them? Greyhound was a what perfectly watchable 90 minutes. But as I say, it, it it's not in any way, shape or form remotely realistic in any no any contextual sense at all. Um, I take on board all of your critiques of um, uh, Midway. It's a classic Roland Emmerich film, but it is largely historically down the yeah, line. Yeah, no, uh, it is actually, uh, much to my surprise. After watching it, I went through Wikipedia and thought, oh, that actually did happen. Mm. Um, I also have to say, it's got an absolutely stonking Atmos soundtrack. Well, I watched it in glorious stereo because uh, that's what I do these it's days. That, but um, uh, well, maybe, but I still thought it sounded very nice. Um, you know, it, it'd be an interesting experience one these days to, to come over and just w watch a watch a film on two seven what uh, two speakers that cost seven grand rather than thirty eight speakers. See it, you know, just 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 to sort of see where that goes. Um, a friend of mine pointed out that I got more speakers on the ceiling than most people have in their um, entire system. Well, yes, you are now very firmly an outlier. Um, but um, yeah, I, I I have to say I thought um, Midway passed quite quite nicely. And, I, and I, as you say, Tom Hanks couldn't be in a bad film really if he tried. So he Greyhound, it. yeah. is, it's very watchable. But we are we're at the U five seven one levels of historical liberties. I've got to be honest. So you know, yeah. but you know, but no, perfectly watchable in itself. But there, I don't expect that to be repeated anytime soon. I've done my two films, um, and I'm back to listen to music now. So. <laughs> uh, before we go any further obviously um thank you very much for joining us if you're watching us live at the minute uh, lots of people in the chat window at the moment so we've got nasa uh mark brown licensed taxi man sound of sj ken welcome uh, marcus simon phil singh um and lots more uh people joining us on the chat if you haven't joined us on the chat yet then uh, jump in there and give us your questions we'll come to those a little bit later on um so moving away um from personal stuff ed that you've been up to this week uh what's happening in the hi-fi world it's still fairly quiet we still haven't dealt with all of the things that were supposed to be launched at munich but um as this is probably not going to be prime conversation piece for, for Tuesday's podcast, Denon has, as well as some enormous AV amplifiers, has been updating their CIOL uh, all-in-one, well, say, it, it, miniature component system. Um, this, as... Uh, you know, for years, I, I always thought that said SOL. 
I, well, I don't know. I I just look at it and I just pronounced it as I see it. But that's that's me being yeah. disarmingly literal. Um, this is, if you like, if you wanted to contextualise this, this is very close. This is a further evolution of the Morant system that I reviewed for the site recently. It's been tweaked and tucked, and it comes in and all together. I have to say, it looks lovely. Um, and um, it would appear that these systems are still doing the numbers because. That they do, they still seem to be churned out by the major Japanese house brands, even though I don't know, actually know anyone that owns one. Um, but nevertheless, they seem it seems to be doing doing very well. Network audio, dead ons. Um, oh god, I've quite forgotten what it's called, which is embarrassing. Heos, there we Heos. go. It's got Heos. Um, you can still play a CD in the front of it if you're feeling retro. And um, it, as I say, it just looks it looks great. Um, if there's interest for that, we'll gladly get one in and give it a prod um and if you fancy something which looks a bit more retro um ruark has also released um an all-in-one but theirs is a true all-in-one because it has the speakers on board as well um ruark used to make very trad loudspeakers indeed and they pivoted effortlessly to making these all-in-one systems and they've done a fabulous job of it so there's all signs point to um let me get the model number of this correct because i haven't the r5 thank you steve uh all signs point to it probably being rather good the full-sized R7 one, as well as looking like it escaped from the set of Austin Powers, is actually a really nice sounding well, thing. I, re I reviewed the R5, and that was excellent. So, yeah, that again, all signs point to that being extremely good. And um, before I sign off, we go to other people. Can I just say thank you to you all who have contributed feedback to the, the perfect album piece? Um, loads of interesting suggestions there. I will say that some of you are obviously more tolerant of poor tracks than I am. Because, you know, some of you, I was looking at those thinking, that's mostly a great album, but I don't like that, don't like that, so on and so forth. But nevertheless, some cracking solutions there, um, and cracking suggestions. And um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for contributing. Um, I'll be wading through the suggestions, and hopefully we can get some sort of playlist and, and, uh, and follow up done for that and i am still open to suggestions on where you might like me to go in a 50 album list as well because there's time left in the month for me to work out where we might go for that as well yeah i definitely think we need to uh, obviously come back and revisit this um because we're going to revisit the physical media debate that we had last week because the thread exploded um after last week's podcast and um, thank you very much for taking part in that um the guys will have a quick look through and pick out um some of the major points that were made in that thread because there was some really interesting discussing it discussion in there about physical media about moving over to streaming and so on so um we'll come on to that a little bit later and we'll do that with ed's piece as well um because uh, I think it only went live in the morning and by the time I looked at it in the afternoon or early evening, it had almost 100 replies. So, um, mm. so yeah, it's it's obviously hit a nerve and we need to uh, delve into that and find out what people think. So I have to um, say people have been very polite at each other's suggestions. There's been, you know... I, so far. So far. No, but no, oh, yes, well, I know. Yeah, and it's it, one uh, man's opinion, right, at the end of the day. I mean, I put yeah. my 10 pence worth in. Um, I have to say, Star. Dogman awesome. Star, I had... I had, I, you know, it's one of those ones. It's, I've got it on CD. I've got it ripped on the library. And do you know what, Steve? I listened to it again. I can, I can perfectly see where you're coming from on that one. I, I had, I, I think it's been several years since I last listened to it. And yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. So Good stuff. solid. Excellent. Um, okay, let's move over to Dr. Death. Steve? Yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Every week I've got to talk about some poor sod who's died. I feel like, I feel like the Grim Reaper sitting here. I should be wearing a cowl and carrying her a size. And... I'm sure Stuart could knock something up in about five yeah, minutes. Yeah, I'm sure he could. <laughs> I actually kept my mouth shut. Um, yeah, so um, if you ever watch uh, Mythbusters, um, and, and I think there was a sort of version of Mythbusters, wasn't there, on, on one of the other... Uh, the White Rabbit project. project. White Rabbit. That's the yeah. one. Yes, thank you. Anyway, if you watched either of those, and you'll probably be familiar with uh, Grant Imahara, who sadly uh, passed away at only 49. And yeah, it was a brain shocking. aneurysm too, which is, you know, so you're, you're, you're walking along, you're, you're keeping a healthy life, you're feeling great, and all the time there's a ticking time bomb in your head, and that's it, clang, oh, gone in a second. Uh, really sad and really shocking, obviously, because, you know, you just wouldn't mm. expect it. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's, from what I can tell... Genuinely nice bloke. I haven't seen a bad word said about him anywhere on, on the Twitter sphere uh, or anywhere else on the internet for that matter. Um, and uh, yeah, um, not just uh, Mythbusters and White Rabbit Project, but also um, he got, his career goes back to ILM. He actually did the models, mm -hmm. worked on the models for the Phantom Menace, among other things, worked through the prequels. 
So um, a talented guy, a very nice guy, and uh, a bit of a shocking loss there, really. Yeah. So it's very, yeah. Sad, very sad. 49. I mean, that's four years younger than me. So, yeah, that's yeah. sad. No, it, it, he, he was always interesting when he was on the show. Um, he, he always did uh, a lot of the technical stuff. Because it, it used to work. There was the two main hosts. They would do stuff. And then there was Grant and a couple others. I forget the the names of them. It's been a long time since I last saw it. But I used to enjoy the mix of, of having two different teams doing two different things. And I always found his approach to um, to what they were doing. It's, the one that sticks out was the Jaws episode. Do you remember that one? Where they they, they did the, the bite radius and all the rest of it. And how big would the shark need to be? And would could you blow up a shark by shooting the, at, the, uh, at the canister in the mouth? That kind of thing. Um, but yeah, he, he, he always came across on screen as, as somebody who was just down to earth and, and loved what he was doing and so on. And it is shocking at 49 to, you know, to lose uh, anybody at that age. It's, uh, yeah, not uh, nice. I think the biggest shock is just because, you know, it's not like he was, I mean, the next person I was going to talk about, Kelly Preston, obviously she's been battling breast cancer. But, you know, to be, a brain aneurysm is always a shock, isn't it? Because it's just, you don't yeah. know you've got one and suddenly you're dead. And there's mm. nothing you can do about it either. I mean, it's just, that's it. Um, yeah, it's really, really sad. Very sad. My heart goes out to his family and friends. Yeah. yeah. And like you say, Kelly Preston as well. Yeah, John Travolta's like... wife, Kelly Preston, only 57, died of cancer. Um, poor John Travolta. He's had a rough few years because his son died not so long ago, yeah. a couple of years ago. Jet. Um, yes, Jet died. Uh, so now his wife's dead uh, at, at a young age, like I say, 57. I mean, Kelly Preston, not a massive film career. I mean, she was in Christine. I remember seeing her in that. And uh, she's obviously Jerry Maguire's girlfriend in the film that um, Ed loves so much. Uh, um, and unfortunately for her, she was also in Battlefield Earth, <laughs> which is unbelievably bad. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's sad. So she, she's passed away as well. So um, hopefully next week I can do a podcast without having to talk about anyone dying. <laughs> probably, I've probably just cursed a few people there. <laughs> I don't think you've mentioned, if we, as long as we don't mention anyone who's still alive. Well, I mean, they, you, they, no one's technically being jinxed anyway. If they die, they're done sort of their own volition. So we'll see how we go. Yeah. Didn't I, John Travolta's uh, first um, relationship, didn't she die of cancer as well? I don't know. You know more about than I do then. Diana um, Highland. So so I think... I think. So basically Travolta's just jinxed. And yeah, yeah. She, she died of cancer, I think, um, a year after they... Breast cancer after they got together. So he's, he's had a, a pretty um, tough ride of it. Yeah. He hasn't had much luck there. Uh, Steve, what have you been up to yourself? I, um, well, this is, I'll talk to you about this, Phil, because I think you're the only person who's going to understand. But if you've got a projector screen and it's not acoustically transparent, you always have the issue of having to put it above your speakers. And when I first um, set up my home cinema and got a scope ratio screen, I had a pair of floor standards, BMW floor standards. So yeah. I put the screen screen above them because it wasn't acoustically transparent and which meant it was pretty high <laughs> up and um i've since got different speakers so it doesn't need to be that high and and i, I thought i could move it but i thought well you know what i could just get an acoustically transparent screen and i can move it down um so it's at a more correct height have the speakers behind it so i don't see the speakers makes looks looks nicer um and probably get a slightly bigger one too <laughs> and move it a little bit closer uh, it's basically, it was win-win all round. So I did. I bought a um, Seymour screens, the US company. Um, I bought one of their 2.35 to 1 acoustic transparent screens uh, with magnetic side masking for 1.8 or 1.78 to 1, which, again, is a nice feature that I didn't have before. Um, you just literally slot them on with magnets and then just take them off when you're not using them. So uh spent the weekend <laughs> setting that up, basically. Uh, and uh, It's worth it. It's a new toy. Oh. Yes, it's it's definitely worth it. It's, it's the the improvements are, uh, and it's it's a better quality screen than last year. I had a Corrado before, which was fine, but you know it was a cheap vinyl screen really. Um, yeah. This is a bit more expensive, but uh, the results are fantastic. I oh, wish what? I'd had it when I was reviewing the LG laser projector. <laughs> <laughs> It would have made my life a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, it would have. Um, before we go into the LG laser projector, what gain have you gone for? It's one one point two, I think. It's just a slight right. gain. It's basically nearly unity. Um, right. right. Slight gain to 1.2, yeah. I think it is. Not, that's a good question. I'll check. <laughs> I think it's 1.2. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean... Was, was yours unity or was yours got a slight gain? No, mine's, mine's is 0 0.9. Um, oh. Because... You've got, because, got a blacked out room there, haven't you? Yeah, 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 but the uh, but the actual screen is zero point nine because it's uh, because of the weave that that it uses. So I've got a screen. Um, is it Tom? 
uh, excellence um, screen, and uh, it's just it's the in lighter four K is what they call the material. Yeah, and it's a zero point nine because obviously there's so much light actually going through the screen because of all the tiny little holes that's that's. Well, this is a that. weave as well, but yeah. I don't think. I don't, yeah. I don't. I think it's at least one, if not slightly above one. I, I don't think it's negative. Right. Yeah. I'm sure it isn't. Yeah. Well, mine's zero point nine, so it's, it's it's almost unity. You know what I mean? It and, and looked I, brighter. Make a huge difference. It looked brighter. I realised because previously the projector was projecting almost directly at the screen. Yeah. And it was bouncing straight back, and of course it was quite high up, so I wasn't getting the full benefit. Now the projector's projecting down towards the screen. It's then bouncing off and down at me. So in fact, um, another win for me is it is actually slightly brighter. <laughs> Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, I'd love to do it in my room. I just don't, I've got acoustically transparent screen. I just don't have the room to move it forward because if I move it forward, I'll lose the throw ratio. So I'd actually lose. Well, that was my big worry. That was my big worry. I haven't really slept for the last three days because it arrived on <laughs> Thursday. So I had to basically, um, I haven't done much work. <laughs> I arrived on Thursday. I had to um, empty out the old home cinema because um, obviously we need to get in. My friend came round um, on, uh, on Friday. And we then um, took down the old screen. Uh, we built a wooden, it was a bit of, <laughs> we built a wooden frame essentially about 30 centimeters away from the wall, which was enough space to put the uh, MKs behind. And then um, attached the screen to this wall, this wooden, wooden frame that we created, sorry. Um, and, you know, I, I, my big worry was I, I was pretty sure I had enough throw. But, you know, I wasn't 100 because it is a slightly larger screen and it is a bit nearer. So I actually ended up moving the projector back 30 centimetres because I had some room behind it. It worked out perfect. So right. I, I can sleep well tonight. <laughs> yeah. Although, although when you get certain projectors in for... No, you should be... Actually, you're using a JVC, so you should be at the full throw at that. I don't think I it'll be anything... I'm almost at the full throw. There's a little yeah, bit more, but I'm basically almost at the full So you'll be, what, so, about 18 feet, is it? 15, 18 feet. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, but, but the good thing is, sorry, Gunther. What I was going to say is the, the thing that I love about acoustically transparent screens, why I'd want to do it and why I think everybody should do it in a cinema room if you can, is that once you remove the speakers from your sight line, for some strange reason, you no longer you no longer have any references to where the sound's coming from apart from in the sound stage. And it's a strange concept then a strange I've got a feeling. question for you phil actually yeah? because this is something that i was debating with my friend this morning uh, um because so i initially had um speaker stands so that the mks could sit below my old screen yeah now the screen is lower and i was debating well i ended up i bought some higher speaker stands because i wanted to have the speak the speakers higher well i was trying to get them towards the middle of the screen but I realized that actually the speakers are then too high. I mean, I did, I think it should be about ear level. Um, and they were too high. So I've actually gone back to the old speaker stands I was using, which actually are, are, are you know, a couple of inches above the bottom of the screen. So how high are your speakers in behind the screen? Well, I don't have them behind the screen because I don't have room oh, to have them behind the oh, screen. I see. So, you don't so, have them. so I don't have it like that uh, because, like I say, I, I lose the throw ratio. So if I move the screen, um, too far away from the wall, I lose I lose my throw, and obviously the you know I'd, I'd have gaps uh, either side of the image. Um, no, the uh, what I would suggest is maybe look at building a buffer wall, Steve, if you can. Is there anything else on that wall? No. No. Well, I was I would... thinking about doing a buffer wall, but then should the speakers be central to the screen? Are um, you going to really notice any difference? Because, like you say, yours are below the screen. Mine were below the screen. It wasn't like I ever yeah. realised that. This is like I, the again, worst it's... episode of Grand Designs <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is no, an AV podcast. AV podcast, is, and it's an important question. Yes, um, I think you've got to work out. Your, if you work out your seating position, Steve, um, and then work out because you've got the um, you haven't got the MPs, have you? You've actually no, got S one fifties, so you have to have full cabin. As they are so, now, they're basically at ear height, right, and, and the bottom third of the screen. Yeah. But I don't, I mean, I could have had them higher up, but then the other problem I had was that then they were kind of quite, un, you know, the stands were a bit wobbly because they were very high stands, probably too high for, for that kind of speaker. So, by the way, there'll be some stands on this classified quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> and an old screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, to be honest, I'm not going to be asking for much money. I just want someone to take them off my hands at this point. If, if you can. Oh, explain. you want Gumtree for that? <laughs> uh, if, you, if you want if you want literally to be degraded via 28,000 text messages <laughs> just sell something on Gumtree um it's uh it's always a life reaffirming experience 
Just I mean, to... obviously, if you actually want to sell a, pro a proper AV product, for goodness sake, use the AV forums classified. But for, for, for my entertainment purposes, I want Steve to use Gumtree. <laughs> can we be clear on this? So, okay, yeah. we'll see what we can do. Um, while you've got the means to experiment, Steve, um, I would just try put them up a little bit higher and angle them down, see if we see what kind of difference that makes. Um, or Because if once you go over your your height, it's probably, yeah. I would leave them where they are, probably. But I think as they are now, they're at ear height, which is ideal. Technically, you, people would say they were setting a system up, put the speakers at ear height. Yeah. And then, and because they're in the lower third of the screen, I mean, as you say, you can't see the speakers. Your brain just, you know, it yes, just... Right. I, I can't locate well, them. I don't so think you're making it. Plus, these, these stands are a lot more stable. So I think yeah. I don't want the I don't want the speaker falling through the front of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I would, I would look at the uh, baffle wall if you can. Um, that's the idea. Yeah. Yep, but this so. was a quick and dirty solution, basically, rather than going full hog for a bit just to get things. Basically, at this point, I just wanted to make sure it worked because, I mean, like I say, I was cacking myself and thinking, am I going to, is it going to be too big? Because it looks, when we installed it, it looked bloody enormous. Yeah. I mean, it, I love the screen that I've got in my room, but like I say, it's absolutely on the maximum at the moment. Mm, yeah. And and that was me being greedy when I spec the screen and I spec'd it with Neil Davidson, Neil, who used to be on the podcast a, a long, long time ago. Um, we spec the screen, to, I think it is 120 inches, and it's it's a curved screen as well, which is logical on a, in a projection system because you want the light to hit the screen at the same same time right across, keep the brightness uniform. So that was the reason I spec the screen, but I, I was greedy. I wanted so much real estate that I'm actually right at the limit now. So, um, yeah, I think if I was to redo the screen, I'd probably do it a few inches, maybe do 115 inches instead of 120. Yeah. Um, one thing, one thing I will say is um, for 1.85 or 1.78 to one content on a 2.35 to one screen, those side masking panels make a fantastic difference. They do. They yep. really do make a difference. Having that extra black border at the sides as well yeah. makes a huge difference. It does. Yeah, and, and all you've got to think about is you want something that is absolutely black next to the picture. That's what yeah. gives you the contrast yeah. as well. Absolutely, right, yeah. I think we've discussed enough of this. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll be quick. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wish I'd had this because it would have made my life a lot easier because this is it is LG's HU85LS, which is the UK version. There's also an LA, which is a, um, other territories, which has a built-in tuner. The UK one does not have built-in tuners. So this is a laser projector, three laser projector, short, ultra short throw, uh, and it uses... Um, um, DLP chip, the um, uh, not the four times flashing, the, t the twice one where they just yep. diagonally move, move it. So, um, so it's not native 4K, but you wouldn't tell a difference, frankly, on most content. It looks looks very sharp and very detailed. And obviously, it's single um, single chip, so um, so the the image is very sharp. Uh, it's essentially designed to be a um, alternative to a television. So it's it's five thousand quid. That's not cheap, but if you were trying to get a, a ninety to one hundred and twenty inch TV you'd be paying more than five grand. So it's it's designed for a specific uh, section of the market. Clearly, if you yeah. want a projector, don't get this. Get a, I, you know, you get a, get a Nepsen TW6 uh, 9400 uh, for half the price, and it's way, way better. I think you need to put that in a context as well, because yeah. uh, only about two or three years ago, Sony had exactly the same type of thing on they the market. They did, I remember it. And it was £25,000. So... You know the fact that this is five grand. That's quite a difference just in three years. Um, oh yeah, and also, I mean, it's not... iSense do this as well, don't they? They do a version. They've of got this. one. There's a six and a half grand, I think. Six yeah. and a half grand, off the top of my head. But that comes with its own screen, quite useful. Right. Yeah. And it also comes with a better sound system. So the HG985 does have built-in speakers, but you know, let's be honest, <laughs> they're, they're okay for you know a bit of news. But if you're going to have a big screen, you want a big sound system to go with it. So at least get a sound bar. Um, the uh, Hisense does come with basically its own soundbar and subwoofer, and, and, and a sub is a big, big factor in that. You know, having a more powerful sound stage at the front of the room. But um, performance-wise, it was great. It's, it's kind of it was really weird because it's essentially a, an LG TV in terms of its menu system and its choices, and the you know as you, as setting it up all very. It's got WebOS built into it, so like I say, it's just designed to be essentially a alternative to a television, although it doesn't have a tuner in this country. Um, and so you've got WebOS built in, hasn't got the same kind of choice as WebOS on, on an LG TV. So there's only the basic stuff like Netflix um, and um, YouTube and Amazon, no uh, BBC, no, no iPlayer or um, you know, other UK capture services yeah. on it. And um, it does, it's not ISF certified. So they're, they're on the, it's got bright room, dark room options, but they're not ISF bright room, dark room options. Um, it is pretty bright, uh, so for 2000 lumens, 
Um, so you, you can you can use it in a room during daytime. It's not ideal. Still struggles. Um, you know, watch, projectors are just not designed. Any kind of projector, frankly, is not designed to be used in a, watching in a brightly lit room. So if you can make it a bit darker, it would be better. Darken the room completely. It will look a lot, you know, look really good. Um, obviously, it's laser, so long lifespan. Wider color gamut. And um, it's got um, uh, instant on and off. So it's got those kind of advantages. And um, as I say, it's ultra short throw. So in other words, you have to have, and this is where I had a problem because I had to basically remove my center speaker in order to get the damn thing close enough to the screen. Yeah. And I had to create some sort of platform to get it high enough because you've got no option. It's, it has, you know, there's no lens shift going on here. You can focus it, that's it. You basically, the size of the image depends on how far away from the screen you are. And we're talking about between sort of 50 and 90 centimeters. It's very, very close to the wall or screen. And you could use it with a wall. Uh, it depends on how smooth and flat your wall is, really. Um, I was using it with screen, obviously. Um, I did also use it in the lounge with a wall just to see how it would do in daylight because my home cinema is not exactly where this projector would be used. Um, but yeah, you've got very little latitude in terms of installation, so you need to bear that in mind. Um, for me, that was a nightmare just because there was a speaker in the way initially until I moved it and then you know created some sort of platform to put it on, a bit of a pain. But performance-wise, it's very good. So um, yeah, it's, it's HDR. It's like I say, it's, it's it's not native 4K, but it looks very detailed and very sharp. It's and, always um, struck me that these things, it sounds like the perfect solution for pubs to show football, but not at £5,000. You know, in other words, you have a, a modern gastro pub, but when they want to pack them in for match events, they wheel out their ultra short throw projector, just probably not at five grand a pop. I mean, does anyone do anything, as you say, in this? There are lots of ultra short throw projectors now on the market. It's been a glut of them recently, particularly some Chinese um, models I've noticed. So, uh, and they're cheaper. So there are alternatives. And I'd say five grand is toward not, the high sense is more, um, but it's it's towards the higher end of the, of the market for ultra short throw projectors. Um, but, you know, it's a laser light, it's a laser light source that's going to add to the price. Um, you know, it's not native 4K, but it, it is it is nearly 4K and it, it's, it's 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 designed to be a relatively high end product. It, it, like I say at the beginning, it's it's aimed at a very niche part of the market. Um, mm. Those who want the benefits of a large screen TV, but without having to shut up for you know, buy a large screen television, and also it takes up less space, of course, than a big TV would. So, but unlike a TV, in terms of its HDR, will beat the pants off it, and a TV will will be much much better for a bright room. So it depends to on be the fair, in the context in the context of LG, it makes sense because it's not like LG are wanting for options for people looking for a conventional television. It's clearly just obviously broadening the horizon, broadening the scope of of their solutions for for the real world in 2020 and whatever. Yeah. It's it's a shame it doesn't have in this country the tuner because then it would be a viable alternative to a television. I mean, as it is, you're still going to have some kind of have to have some kind of box for um, yeah. things like Freeview and that sort of stuff. But it's it's a nice little product. It looks nice. It's very well made. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think five grand is quite a lot of money. I mean, as, as a projector fan, I can never buy it. You know, I, I never spend five grand on that. You can get, well, you can get the Sony T270, native yeah. 4K projector for the same price. Yeah. Well, yeah, but right. if, I did, if I took that to its logical, I'd never review half the things I do for the site, Steve, because it's like, well, mate, if you're a purist, you can do it this way. But it, uh, you, you've identified already in how, what you said, it, it exists to fulfill actually a very niche requirement but a requirement nonetheless and i don't i don't think anyone's going to set out with a short list of one projector which would be mounted to the ceiling in an entirely conventional fashion and one which would be you know what the funny thing is you can actually mount this on the ceiling too and inverse the image <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know who would do that <laughs> well to yeah. be honest in some yeah but you say that yeah, maybe well, yeah, in a, yeah actually you know, no that one. makes that makes a degree uh, that actually would be a feature that make it because then it would truly be out of the way in a way that it wouldn't necessarily be if it had to be on a piece of furniture or something. I sort of, that makes sense to me. Okay, well, cool. Oh, someone's just reminded me, by the way, that I forgot to mention Naya Rivera from Glee, who uh, yeah. also died this week, sat tragically drowned um, by accident, only 33. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm glad I didn't work on Glee because that show is cursed. I wasn't going to say that, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I mean, Curly, Corey Monteith, you know, he died of a Daxed overdose, 32. They're the man, Mark Salling, was it? The one who got banged up as a nonce. He committed suicide um, 35. I mean, that, that's young. That's all young. So, yeah, very sad. And a little, poor little kid was stuck in the boat. Um, that was very sad. Yeah, not good. But that's enough death for one. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's get cheered up by Kaz. Yay! 
Oh my god, it feels very petty <laughs> talking about holidays now, but no, no, yeah. no, cheer us up. Where are you going on holiday, Kaz? Cheer us up, Kaz. Well, you know, I have I have absolutely no idea. It's been so hard looking into it. We came this close to booking Bournemouth. Um, but you know, the photos of Bournemouth and, and you're like, well, it's okay, it's on the beach, maybe you'll get us some space to yourself. Um, but it, it it didn't happen. And then we looked at lodges and we looked at everything, obviously inland, and we almost went back to staycation, but we have been locked in this house for a long time. And we're all still alive, but it's close. Um, I, we ended up going to the Jurassic Coast. That's our plan. Nice. It's, I say it's, we're I going, want, we haven't done it yet. But. It's a lovely part of the world. Um, yeah, never, never been before. My, my uh, daughter's obsessed with Mary Anning, is it? Yes, yes, Get yes. right. But, the original uh, she sells there. seashells on the seashore. She was yes. the, one of the, the world's first truly scientifically rigorous fossil hunter, Steve. Okay. I thought that might be the case given it's the Jurassic Coast. She spent um, it's something ridiculous. It was eight years of her life um, extracting uh, correctly and diligently the world's first uh, example of a full pliosaur skeleton. I mean, in terms of focus and dedication, uh, unbelievable. Um, and, and a genuine unsung hero and in the great vein of really eccentric British people uh, on which this country is sort of founded, really. So, yeah. yeah. But the, think... beyond dinosaurs, there's some lovely other things down there as well. Well, I mean, it's, it looks really nice. I think my daughter's hoping it'll probably only take about two hours to find a dinosaur. Uh, <laughs> so, so she's hoping maybe not eight years, but... Um, well, no, she but, found yeah. it relatively quickly. She just took eight years to get it out of the ground. That's yeah, what you I'm need to warn your daughter about. Dinosaur. Yeah, my, my... find a trilobite or something like that. Yeah, she, yeah that's, I think that's what we're going with. And, and it wouldn't take my son eight years to remove anything from anything. He, he He's he's like a... a oh, but uh, a four-year-old bulldozer. Anyway, that's what our plan, and we're actually kind of looking forward to it. So, um, so yeah. And Tom, Tom Davies has just put in the thread that he's in. going, <laughs> he's going to Jurassic Park for his holiday. Now, see, this is we had a big debate about this in the house. The kids haven't seen it yet, but me and the kids are well up for Jurassic Park. My wife seems to think that we should have learnt from the last four films. But I'm well up for it. If they do a Jurassic Park, I'm I'm going there and I'm taking the kids what, along. What could go wrong? What could dinosaurs. possibly go wrong? Yeah, they they'll have learned their mistakes by now. You uh, thought that we've been a case yeah, with the second, third, and yeah, fourth films. It'll be absolutely fine. And yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. In fairness, if you are a Twitter user, there in the last couple of weeks there has been a Twitter account called Jurassic Park Updates, <laughs> which has just. <laughs> absolute genius yeah but um, double your bitcoin on there i'm not going to uh, i'm not going to spoil any of that because um it's uh some, some absolutely magnificent tweets in there so if you're um if you are a twitter user get 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 stuck into that but no i'd probably go as well i just um remember to um not be attractive because it the dinosaurs do seem to go for attractive people that's what we've learned in these many films and um fundamentally as a british person i'm dead anyway so you know uh, it's it's you know i'll, I'll live with that cope with what that about sort. bringing that little flute thing that sam neill has in jurassic park 3 the little uh dinosaur oh, the, the internal, so can make the nose. yeah well i don't have one of those Kaz. i just get get the set get eaten you know I, I don't know if my death would be as gratuitous and unnecessary as the woman who was also in merlin in the original, in the in the first Jurassic World film, oh, where they really fu- dropped in the air and then into the mouth of a massive yeah, dinosaur. I mean it's like <laughs> whatever she did to the film crew, they really went to town with how she died. So <laughs> oh, we're, oh, we're back on death again. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, if I'm going to segue away from death, I noticed that uh, obviously Tom has logged in, um, and we were we need to discuss by what means we only get Tom to review terrible things. Yeah, I suggested that in the thread. I said I said that this is the future, is basically if there's a chance that anything could be bad. And I would say that the best bet is giving him just Netflix movies. We should send well, it Tom's way. Well, he reviewed Cursed, didn't he? Did he review Cursed on Netflix? He reviewed Cursed. I, yes, I read his review oh, yeah, and I watched the first yeah. episode and then thought, yeah, this is bollocks. <laughs> Turned it yes. off. <laughs> yeah, but we've been told officially on that thread by someone that, that reviewers should basically get on a boat and exile themselves because their opinions are worth nothing 
So so that's told us. But other other than that, I would say Tom Tom should definitely I agree with that. Sentiment. Can I just say mm. that he managed to? Um, I mean, Clive James made a career out of this. He became, a, you know, his his. His brilliance was anchored on the way that he reviewed appalling television, and I, I feel that Tom is firmly set to um, to, to stand, stand in these footsteps, uh, in it, following these footsteps. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know whether we can weight. find him a Margarita Pragatan to you know to to, <laughs> to, to, to bounce off, um, and quite how we'd work that in a podcast sense. But um, nevertheless, I think I think the mileage is there. Yes. So, so, so yeah, I'm, anything bad that you think he should review, we'll, we'll suggest it to him. But um, it's, it's difficult to tell, but Netflix is a good place to... to... Hang, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Is this not abuse? No, not he a... asked for it. You know, he said to me that he likes um, King... Well, as you can tell from the review, he likes Arthurian legend, and he was well up for Cursed. Um, so, so he was going for that. Yeah, but it's, it. it's rubbish. You know... You're now thinking about giving them all rubbish stuff to. Sure, okay. Well, that was just because he's talented at, at dissecting rubbish. <laughs> he is. Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, you've got to go where your skill set lies. I, th- I you. think you're just jealous, Kaz, because you've ended up with all these rubbish Netflix films and the one that you gave to him thinking it was going to be Extraction. a load of rubbish. <laughs> Extra- don't. <laughs> don't. Ended up being the best thing Netflix has <laughs> done for a long time. Or will I would do. never. It I is would never their hold number that. one watched film. 90. 90- Nine million households have downloaded, have, have streamed it, at least some of it. Yes, and I'm not one of them. I know, amazing. I find <laughs> I, that staggering. <laughs> I do not hold a grudge against that film or Tom for reviewing it. <laughs> yeah, it almost sounds I'm, like you mean that. I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> Says man who is clearly not over it. <laughs> no, I think. I mean, I think he does a tremendous job at that. But uh, but it, there is a difference. Like he did uh, plot against America. Uh, and I was a bit theories. gutted. Yeah, I was a bit gutted because I didn't know it was from the guy who did the wire. I was like, this guy stepped out of his. Uh, well, the people who did the wire, he stepped yeah, out. Of it's his... David Simon and Ed. Um, uh, what's his name? Ed Burns, not the yeah. Ed Burns of Sensation Private no, Ryan. No, not <laughs> the that other Ed Burns. Burns. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I was I was I was looking forward to it, but I didn't know it was by the people who did the wire. Um, but but Tom has it. Also, Philip Roth, Philip Roth's book is, was written about ten years ago, so it's not. I mean, it's got masses of parallels to Trump, but it wasn't really written as, as that being the case. It just happens to be that someone like Trump is very similar to someone like um, Lindbergh. Um, being remotely topical for a moment, uh, wasn't there in the news that Netflix is doing something with both Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans? They and two hundred yeah. million dollars. Two hundred uh, million. Yeah, the biggest. The Russo brothers. brothers. Yeah. Russo yeah. brothers and and uh, it's. Yeah. Uh, Spy versus spy thingy. The Grey Men is that what it's called? The Grey Men or something like that. Grey Man. Something like that. But it's. Uh, I mean, I I think they're trying to get in on the whole Bourne Bond Brigade because we don't know why when not. Bond's well, there's come no Bond films. Yeah, and it'll take about six years for them to get Daniel Craig back um, for the next one. This is, this is so. Craig's last one, isn't it? Oh uh, yeah, how many times? He has to be. He's, if he's before? not, if he's oh, not, he's... if it's, if he's not careful, there's going to be elements of Roger Moore and a view to a kill. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. No yeah, one yeah. wants to go there. Again. Where he Come can't on. take his shirt off. The last time he did a Bond film, he was going to slit his wrist before he came back to do another one, and yet here he is. No, yeah. Check was... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think that check uh, was pretty large. Yeah. So. yeah, so they'll just bring him back again and then yeah. CGI his face like they did on the bike at the beginning of. Apparently. The rumour going around is that No Time to Die, one of the reasons why they delayed it wasn't so much because of coronavirus, but because they needed to do reshoots, and this was a good excuse to do them. Yeah. Because the plot involved a biological weapon, and they're like, <laughs> uh, maybe we need to change this. But I don't think it, hey, it didn't test very well either. There was elements of the plot. I'm not going to say anything, because I don't want to spoil anything, but it didn't go down well at all. So is it because it film... tries to tie in the last 25 Bond films? Not so much that, but because it's what they give Bond in the film that I don't think James Bond should ever have. Chlamydia? <laughs> no, he's definitely had that many, many times. I should. Uh, yeah. yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you um, know. I'm trying. I'm trying to skirt around. I don't want to. I'd be happy to spoil it because it sounds like bollocks to me. But um, <laughs> I, I've totally forgotten that there was a Bond film supposed to be coming out. To be honest, at this point, I've, I've kind of forgotten there's a cinema. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, because the sequ- yeah. sequel yeah. could feature that-, that character instead, couldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, don't forget, um, we have a Q&A coming up So if you want to ask movie questions Possibly. High five um, 
uh, AV, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Don't worry, I am going to interject if people go too uh, long this evening. Um, and also, don't forget, you can still make a donation. Uh, if you want to do that, just a one-off, streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. Um, or if you want to uh, do the £3 a month and become a patron, it's patreon.com forward slash AV forums. And uh, thank you very much to our recent donors. Uh, their names are up on the right-hand side of your screen at the moment if you're watching live or watching the video back. And our top donors donor is pop fiction at 40 pounds thank you very much uh pop thank fiction you very much, for that. it is appreciated right um what else has been going on ed have you managed to catch big jet tv yet I, i've mentioned it a couple of times to you now no i've been watching um i've gone down the rabbit hole of regular car reviews um yeah i do uh, that as well uh unfortunately that there is a man who aligns perfectly with my way of thinking um uh, I mean, it must be said when he reviews things that I've actually driven, I don't. There's not. A, there's not, not a huge amount of interest there. But when he's busy uh, dealing with the full horror that is an AMC Gremlin, um, uh, that's fantastic. Thoroughly enjoy that. Um, uh, so no, I haven't got onto that yet. And but obviously, I mean, anything I, I, I send to you about planes these days, you're well ahead of it. I mean, I can only assume that the people that post comments on those videos, I'm hoping they make us look well. well yes. You know, yes. Quite. Um, you know, we are uh, we are um, several degrees of normal. <laughs> uh, they, they take their they take their hobby seriously, um, and all and good on them because they they have a, a lot of interest. So if people don't know Big Jet TV, it's a it's a YouTube channel. It's been running a little while. It's also on Facebook and other social media. Um, and basically, it's it's one guy called Jerry. He's got a transit van with a um, a thing on the roof that he puts all his camera gear and everything up on the roof. He goes to Heathrow and Manchester and places like that, uh, outside the gates, uh, outside the fence, but he's high enough up that he can get his camera in and basically films planes coming into land and taking off and so on. But it's been interesting recently because obviously what's going on with, with COVID and all the rest of it, uh, lots, of, lots of changes in aviation. And it's something I've got a slight interest in as well as Ed, when we, you know, we, we always uh, mention aircraft investigation and that kind of thing. It's, it's just one of them nerdy things that I like. Um, but Virgin and obviously BA are retiring their 747 fleets. Mm. Um, and Virgin are retiring them from Manchester and there's been four of them so far. And he's filmed every one. And, and it's been quite an interesting thing to see because loads of the public are turning up. Yeah. Uh, the plane goes down to one end of the, the runway so the public can take photos and all the rest of it. Um, obviously, it's, it's light because it's going gonna, it's gonna to go and, and get this dismantled so most of the internals are taken out there's not a lot of fuel on board so this thing takes off pretty quickly doesn't need much runway to to get up to speed in a way um and what they have been doing is once they're at a certain height they've been doing a wing wave to say goodbye as they go off so it's been interesting to watch that because obviously we're seeing the end of an era here and um you know, 747s, they're just, they're not economical unless you're doing freight. And that's the only way that the 747 is going to survive is um, as a freighter. And they're still going to build them as a freighter for a little bit, a little while longer. But as, as, as a passenger plane, they're done. Um, they're just not ec economical enough to run, certainly with a huge downturn in aviation at the moment. Um, so it's an opportunity now for British Airways to retire their whole fleet. Virgin are retiring their fleet. And they're moving on to... Um, to uh, basically more fuel of, fuel efficient planes like the uh, Air, Airbus A350 and the uh, Dreamliner, Dreamliner, um, and that's all that is flying at the moment. Uh, if you watch his updates from Heathrow and so on, these flights that are coming in at the moment, they're PPE and cargo flights and so on, and it's all Dreamliners and and triple sevens and. Um, the A350s um, and that's all we're going to see flying for a long time I think and just because the fuel efficiency uh, no, no, the, the, the one exception to that is um, bless them all the courier companies uh, still banging away with their MD-11s because that's what they use and it, essentially they um, have, have got an agreement with Boeing to keep getting parts for them for a ridiculous length of time they love them they will yeah, not. Part I, I think. Them. I think the current downturn is going to force a few hands. I think because obviously that the airlines that are more passenger based have had to go um, to ship and freight and all the rest of it. So there's a lot, lot more competition out there for freight at the moment. A lot of the airlines have actually trans, uh, transformed a lot of the planes um, to carry freight rather than passengers and so on. But if you're interested in that, it's really, really interesting um, watching Big Jet TV. Um, although the host is is. Um, What's what's the kind of uh, 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 insufferable? 
Mm. Uh, he's he's a personal taste. <laughs> you either like him or you don't like him. Um, his jokes are terrible, um, and so on. But anyway, it, what he does is is really quite interesting. Um, so if you're interested in that, it's Big Jet TV. Um, and I wanted just a quick update with uh, Robin Kim. Uh, we mentioned him last week. This was uh, uh, Kim was diagnosed um, with terminal cancer, and the Mustang Group all got together and raised money. And um, thank you if you have donated after last week's show. Um, the donations did go up quite quite some uh, some bit on the uh, Just Giving page. The main uh, uh, fundraising, if you're questioning the amount that's on the screen at the moment, was done through the Facebook groups, uh, Simply Mustangs UK and so on. So there was a, a huge amount of money raised through that, doing raffles and all the rest of it. Uh, pleased to say that Kim's been um, accepted for treatment and the first round of treatment has been paid for um, and is going ahead. So that's great news. Uh, all the best, Kim. Um, uh, we wish you well going forward. Yeah, good, good um, right, what else has been going on? Well, uh, talking about cars, I was out in the car today up on a Northumberland coastline run. Uh, that was quite enjoyable today. Did 220 miles. Um, but, you know, it's been a cracking day. The sun's been out and it's been uh, what a fantastic... What was that then, Phil? Uh, that's three quarters of a tank. So, um, so yeah. It, it, At the moment, Steve, yeah. it pains me to admit yeah, it, is. but I think <laughs> I've probably got the worse deal than uh, there are. There are times where um, uh, I um, I let a friend of mine loose in the car earlier this week, and uh, after he came back, he'd done sixteen miles to the gallon. So. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, yours is brand new, Ed, and and as it runs in and as things start to yeah, you know, well, that that the fact that but as, as I say, Milton Keynes uh, is not set up for fuel economy because it's hard it's on the throttle, debris. full <laughs> onto the brake, hard on the throttle. It's a welcome to chicane world. So yeah, you know, it's, yeah. uh, that's all. It, it is what it is. I did enjoy the photo uh, you stuck on. I think it was Instagram this morning where it it, it looked like your car was embarking on its own phone party. I'm assuming <laughs> that's. I mean, not being one to clean cars. I'm assuming this is some sort of elaborate and grossly expensive cleaning routine, but you know, you seem to. No, it's it's yourself. not expensive. Uh, the coatings are what it's expensive. You get that done when it's new, so you get it machine polished, get the paint perfect, put the coatings on, and then you just have to foam wash it after that. So just a quick foam over it, it takes all the dirt off, jet wash it down, quick dry, and it's it's done. So it's actually easy maintenance because I can't wash my car at home. Uh, I don't have a, a driveway or a garage or whatever, um, and that was at a friend's house just to get the car clean for the, for the run. So anyway, I could wash my car at home. I just don't. <laughs> but the good thing is I'm allowed to go to Scotland now so I went up to Scotland last week um, on Thursday finally got to see the family hadn't seen the family since February so that was great uh, just catching up with everybody finding out what had been going on up there um, got to see the culture up there uh, certainly from what I saw while I was there everybody was wearing masks um, everybody was queuing properly to get into the shops and so on um, it seems like second nature up there because They've made it law and, and you have to do it, which they've eventually gotten around to doing down here. And I think, it, yes, it forces people to use face masks. Well, why not use a face mask? You know, if you're going into a confined space like a, a you know a supermarket or whatever, if it's if it's doing a little bit of good, then great, because we need I to think find a new I think half the resistance so. is people thinking, oh, I look ridiculous in a face mask. If you're all wearing a face mask, it really doesn't matter. And there are some cracking patterns out there. I mean, if one is a fashion-conscious lady or gentleman, there are some extremely elegant options to be had yeah. if that um, is that or if that's what you want to do. I mean, I've got a nice uh, dinosaur skeleton pattern for my mask. I'm um, I, I'm very fond of it. The machine washable, very nice. Um, so yeah, just uh, go nuts. I mean, I would say in a cinematic sense, uh, if there is someone out there who can convert um, an Immorton Joe horse tooth respirator to have an N95 filter in it, they will clean up. <laughs> if I could wear one of those to the supermarket, okay. I bloody well would. All actually, I'd wear it all the time. Um, yeah. You know, uh, including when I was driving, simply so I could just run around yelling "mediocre" at people, <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, all I could possibly want to do. Well, so. it was it was interesting to see just the you know the different ways of approaching it because Scotland's been in lockdown a lot longer, and you know, little wee Jimmy Cranky's been making the rules, and and people have been sticking to them. Uh, you might see a photograph of a puppy there on the right hand side if you're watching the uh, the video. Uh, that's a new family member up in Scotland. Uh, he's an ad, not here because if you can see my living room behind me here. It's full of TVs and yeah, where's the green gear. screen, Phil? I uh, couldn't have been asked to set it up this week. <laughs> <laughs> I thought as much. We have started to slip. Yeah, well, I got in at ten past six t tonight, and I was just like, oh, I, I can't be bothered. And anyway, they, you know, that's an interesting look. You know, you've got two OLEDs up there. That's a Panasonic, and there's a Philips 805, which is the big one. Um, 
which is that one there, and that's the uh, the Panasonic. And behind me, oh, actually, that's a Philips box. Behind the Philips box is uh, another LG uh, C10 in for review. Unfortunately, it's not the 48 inch. Uh, I didn't get it on the first round of uh, reviews that, that went elsewhere, but 48 inch will be coming in. So I've got a 55 C10. I've got a 55 HZ2000. Um, we are going to uh, pit them off against each other. As you can see, I can get the two TVs together um, and test them properly. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put them side by side and just see what the actual real world differences are at 55 inches, um, run all sorts of different tests. And the main thing is is viewing tests and so on. I might actually get some TV watched um, this time around. I might, I might actually catch up with what I should be catching up with uh, on TV and so on. So anyway, um, that's coming up. I'm not expecting huge differences. I've already reviewed the HZ 1500. I've already reviewed the 65 inch C10. Um, the differences between them are, yeah, you know, negligible. The LG is more a gaming TV all rounder. Whereas if you're a, a big movie fan, the Panasonics are going to be the TVs for you this year. And um, yeah, I think uh, the HZ 2000 is going to be something from what I've seen so far pretty special um if if that's what you're looking for in terms of you know movies and watching in a dark room and so on i think panasonic this is the second generation of their um you know uh, pro panel and uh, I'm, I'm expecting good things from it from what i've seen so far i think it's uh, it's going to be something pretty special so that's what i'm working on at the moment like say phillips 805 65 inch which is that one there i've been running that a few days i forget how good uh, their TVs are in terms of the Ambulight. I love Ambulight, even though it's unstatic and uh, you know just a, a D65 white. Um, it makes such a difference just having a bias light behind the TV like that. Um, and we keep banging on a bit, and I'm going to keep banging on a bit because I think it's a it's a proper proper uh, solution to what is a problem if you if you watch TV in a slightly darker room, having that behind it. It just you know it keeps the eyes. Um, from tiring and so on. And uh, the image quality, again, from Philips this year, really impressive. I haven't quite run the tests, um, full tests on it yet. Uh, stand by for the review on that one. Somebody asked about high sense as well while I'm talking TVs. Uh, let me just find that. I think it was talking about the U8 QF. Um, I haven't got that in yet. I've asked um, Hisense for that, they've sent me the U7 QF. I've actually reviewed that. I've done all the tests and all the rest of it. Really, really impressive TV uh, for the money. Um, it is a VA panel. It is a full backlight. Viewing angles are uh, a little bit of an issue. But um, if you're like me, on your own, sat in front of the TV, directly in front of the TV, yeah, you won't have any problems with that. So that's what I've been up to uh, at the moment. Um, and like I say, lots of things um, happening with TVs. A little bit slow getting there at the moment and it's just because I'm trying to cram so much through at the moment so it might look like things aren't happening on the website they're all going to drop pretty quickly it'll be like buses you know four or five of them will come along all at the same time um, so that's what we're doing there right so Steve's taking a little bit of a break here uh, and while he does that um, Ken has donated three pounds again um, this must be the third or fourth week in a row Ken thank you very much for your donation it is appreciated uh, thank you very much for all that we're going to move back to physical media um so i did ask the guys to have a look at the thread from last week uh, last week's podcast the the thread exploded i had some uh, excellent excellent posts in there i'm looking at wayne j uh, first of all uh, thank you very much for your post in there wayne i'm not going to read the whole thing because you've actually put quite a lot in there but it's all really uh, pertinent points and so on but the thing i want you to pick up on um which i think is 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 a good argument that you've made and that's the convenience factor um and this is something that we've mentioned a few times when we've been discussing this um is the is the the whole convenience thing and and what wayne points out is that with a 4k uh, and uh you know i'm not this is not word for word but with a 4k uhd uh, uh disc you get the blu-ray in there as well and you're paying 24 pounds um and what he's suggesting is that if that that price was 15 to 18 quid, he's more likely as an impulse buy to buy that than pay 24 pounds or 25 pounds um, for a disc. And I think that's a really interesting point. Do we need a Blu-ray, Steve, in a 4K UHD package? Do you need that Blu-ray in there? Is, is there any reason why you would have that 
apart from the extras. Yeah, that's the. I mean, there are some studios. I'm trying to think now. I think Universal and Steve, Lionsgate. Your microphone is clearly not working. <laughs> clearly, yeah. Not. I mean, it, it it is the extras, isn't it? The the only a few of the studios actually bother to port the extras over to the 4K discs. The rest of them are so lazy they just leave them on the on the accompanying Blu-ray and say flip it, stick on the Blu-ray which is particularly insulting when they can't even be bothered to stick yeah. a commentary track on. So you have to watch the whole film again in 1080p just to hear a commentary track. I mean, it's it's just laziness. There's no reason why they can't stick it on a 4K disc. Cost-cutting, I think, largely. Yeah. Um, I think it's Lionsgate cheaper. Lionsgate Universal do, I think, give most of the extras on, yes. the, Blue, on the 4K discs these days, but uh, the other studios are a bit... Yeah, a bit lazy yeah Lion- that, but... Lionsgate are really good about it. And of course, uh, you know, back catalogue studios like Studio Can- Canal, the older titles that are revisited are generally treated quite well, but I, I don't never understand it for new releases. I also don't think it's probably much for them to throw in a Blu-ray, which they're already producing with the extras anyway, uh, versus porting it all over to the 4K, which seems to them like a hassle. And they can justify a five, ten quid bump uh, for what I can't imagine costs them more than pennies at their end. I don't, I don't know how much it actually costs to stick the disc in, but they probably don't see it as a loss at all. And there are, of course, or at least originally, there are a few people who bought 4K when they were at that transition stage, when they weren't fully committed, knowing they had a Blu-ray and knowing that one day they'd like to play the 4K disc. I think it's a bit uh, optimistic to think there are many people like that anymore, but I guess that's that was originally the plan. Yeah, I, I get that, I, and, and I get where you're coming from there, cars in terms of cost to them, and you know, like you say, they're already producing the Blu-ray, so it's not an issue to to shove it in that package. I just think twenty five pounds is just too much. Twenty pounds is a yeah. psychological breakpoint, uh, yeah. and it's not yeah. just for UHD. Um, if I'm going to spend more than twenty pounds on a record. It needs to have some significant bells and whistles on it for me to want to go near. And it realistically, for starters, it needs to be a double album, which isn't a factor really for UHD movies. Um, and I, I am going to want more than just a bare bones release. And it's interesting that actually record labels have been quite good at this. They have, for significant releases, there is now a uh, a pattern of if you just want a single black lp in a standard sleeve it's x and then a a, a ritzier release will be more money and people can choose that if they wish performance wise there's nothing to call between the two of them but uh people get excited about colored vinyl they get excited about gatefolds and 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 you know pictures and stuff that comes with it and steel books yes well that's a, a a useful sort of comparison point but it's nice to have that you know for the for the i just want the content the bare bones release is is absolutely ideal and that needs to be done a bit more often yeah uh, god Mueller says uh, if getting up and putting a disc in a player is inconvenient we're all in trouble yeah i agree with that Gordon. well uh, yeah look, hang on a second like, yes no, yes yeah. and no um because it's not it, you know got to take uh, i have now run without a disc player for over two years and uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'm coming going, coming back. Um, the the comments about you know differences in, in performance quality are entirely valid, but from my perspective, I don't I just don't care that much. And two, it's only going to go one way. Don't forget, I'm coming at this from a, an audio two channel audio perspective. Cobuzz is now capable of delivering albums that I own and have paid money for in a higher quality than I can buy them in any in any meaningful sense, unless I then buy them from Cobuzz. So um, don't, don't, what we're looking at is a snapshot of how things are at the moment. Over time, as restrictions on bandwidth ease and uh, we tinker about with compression and so on and so forth, um, it's, uh, it, it's a, um, it, it, it's a given that, what we take as the benchmark quality that UHD delivers can easily be eclipsed. And then the comment becomes different again. At the moment, it hasn't. So the argument is, you know, where where true cinephiles go. For audiophiles, that question is sort of being answered in real time. Yeah. 
completely different market, so Ed, and I think there's there's more to um, the, putting a movie on a disc than than an audio release. But I get where you're coming from. I, I, and well, yes, yes, no, hang on a second. I, uh, I do agree. I, so I, we've got I, H.266 coming soon, which is VCC, which is a new codec. So we could actually see uh, getting to the point that you were making there um, about quality and so on. If but how many times, oh, just a question I'm going to ask both you and Steve, how many times do you, uh, I mean, what's your most watched set of extras on a disc? Is there something that you dig out time and time again in extras terms? Uh, no, I'm all for the quality of the film and the presentation of the film. I've, to be honest with you, it's been years since I've actually watched any documentaries because they're not produced in the same way that they were. They're usually just ago. EPK, yeah, um, exactly. you know, fluffy promotional stuff. The days of the, you know, the three and a half hour in depth Lord of the Rings docs. That was no, that's long gone. Yeah, they're they're long gone. It's it's all yeah stuff that's done. So if that's market, if that's so. the case, then in term if extras is a limited thing so we, we, it comes down purely to a qualitative exercise and, th and that's 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 not an if it's a when it's just how long it takes yeah um so what you were trying to get at there where you were saying you know you're getting better quality through your streaming service than what you can actually buy when we're way from that uh, oh yes i know far away from that at the moment but there are developments coming along so you've got h.266 which is a new codec um which is going to help 8k come along and this is the big thing you know 8k is is going to be you know very data heavy um to start with and it needs to they need to find a way of compressing it and this is going to be the way that they are um suggesting or recommending that we move forward so it could be that quality um, gets a, a big shot in the arm in terms of picture quality and sound quality and so on through streaming services. Um, that could happen, but that's not there at the minute. We still have a physical format. We still have a physical format that could be improved and could see better sales if it was aimed at the consumer better because what I think the model they're using is an ancient model that that perhaps Laser works for DVD and, and Blu-ray. Um, and it's not working for 4K. Um, they need to they need to rethink it, or they need to give up. And I think at the minute it looks like they could be giving up uh, and moving everything across to streaming. If you look at what some of the streaming services are offering now, which is extras and you know audio commentaries and all the rest of it, it, it looks like that that could be the future. Steve, I'm thinking you know Disney Plus is the most advanced when it comes to that kind of thing at the minute, and that yeah. could be the way we go. I mean, there were extras. For example, there's a couple of deleted scenes, a few deleted scenes on. Disney Plus for the uh, for Avengers Endgame that aren't on the disc, and that's becoming more common that they're they're including extras on streaming services or they're including them as, as retail exclusives like Best Buy or whatever in the states. So um, yeah, I, I think I think you know yes, the new release is twenty five quid, but it's down to twenty below twenty pretty quickly. So if you want it, if you don't want to pay twenty five, you can wait. I think uh, if it's a film that you really want, it's a film you, that you love or something you're really interested in, you know, 25 quid compared to two people going to the cinema isn't a big difference. I mean, you could easily drop 25, 30, 40 quid if you're going to the movies for the evening. So it's not a massive outlay. Um, I think what I'm what I'm doing nowadays is if it's something that I really want, you know, because it's a, a film I really love or something I'm you know, a director I'm really into, then I'll go for the disc because it's the highest quality, highest bit rate, best picture, best sound, end of story. Um, if it's something I'm not that bothered about, you'll buy it anyway. You'll buy it. Ooh, no, of not, not the these days. Uh, um, but yeah, Jimmy, I watch it on the uh, streaming service. I mean, I've watched quite a few, few things on on because every, you know, every week I just quickly check Amazon Prime, and there'll be something that's popped up that I haven't seen. For example, Ed, you watched Midway, so there'll be something that pops up you haven't seen, it, and you can watch it for now. So. Yeah, it, I think it's going to be a mixture of the two. But from the studio's perspective, clearly they want to stream it because it's more money for them and it's quicker. Um, sorry, um, very quickly, Carsten K. How can anyone think 4K BDs are going to disappear if vinyl records have survived and become more expensive than, than CDs? Simple, because uh, the technology to play records can be built by men in sheds. It's as blunt as that. It survived a period of time where nobody gave a single shiny expletive deleted, um, but it can be maintained on a shoestring. It's engineering, not... Um, it's, it's heavy engineering. Um, it, we discussed this last week, and the MOQs, minimum order quantity for discs, is smaller than I anticipated. But nevertheless, it requires a baseline level of investment, which is not a given. Please do not assume that the 
uh, survival of certain things is is innate, is guaranteed. Um, so it's it's not the same thing. And the other thing is that um, each disc player. I mean, obviously, late you know, 4K UHDs are back compatible with 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 most other bits of, of, of software um, but it's not quite the same thing that I can stick pretty much anything from 1955 onwards onto my gyro deck and it just it just works it again backwards compatibility is a given at the moment but it's not innate and it's not assumed if it becomes a case where you can make a transport with a red laser but not a blue laser or vice versa you don't get automatic compatibility back with everything else so um it's it's a bit of a more complicated situation as to how survivable these things are uh steve you've had a, a look through the thread anything else that, that uh, jumped out at you from uh, the members i quickly mention a few things um to uh steve stevie dr stevie doctor stevie drive <laughs> uh, that columbia box set yeah get it mate 120 quid well spent um just for lance of arabia alone to be honest um what else have I got here? There's something else I noticed. Oh, yes. Um, so someone mentioned, uh, who was it? Yes, Gordon Wheeler. 8K needs to be under 40 meg to make it mainstream. So that's one of the reasons we were talking about a second ago, H2, H.266 VCC codec. Um, that The idea behind that is to get 8K content down to something approaching a, a, a sort of realistic streamable level. I think at the moment they're just aiming at getting it below 80. But clearly that for most people that's still high and too high. Even, even I couldn't do 80. To be fair, uh, um, my uh, my ex-wife has just had... Uh, Milton Keynes has now got uh, fiber to house infrastructure. She's, going, uh, she's ticking over nicely at 651 megs down and 280 up. up. Um, so she's all set for 8K. Um, I'm yeah, not, she's good. But, she's fine. Yeah, you could do 8K yeah. un, 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 uncompressed at that kind of level. But yeah, I, I think he's right. Gordon's right. It, um, you know, you want to get the codex as efficient as possible and get 8K down to something that the majority of people can stream. Although, having said that, you know, it's going to be primarily sport, I guess, because there's not much content. That there's no content at 8K. Yeah, in terms of film, uh, they might be shooting in 8K or higher res, but um, they're not finishing it. They're not finishing anywhere near that. Um, there are 8K masters. It was it 2001 that got screened in Japan, didn't it, last year? And um, and look, mentioning Lawrence of Arabia. That's 65 mil film, so that was done. That scanned 8K. But aside from the odd 8K scan of a 65 millimeter film, there is no film content out yeah. there. That absolutely. And coming back to the thread, Steve, from last week, uh, the one that everybody's been, you know, uh, contributing to, and and, and obviously it, it's been uh, really interesting seeing a lot of the comments here. Was there anything in that that jumped out at you that you want to raise at the moment? No, we covered it all from what I can remember. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, let's move on then. Um, and let's look at another uh, few questions and so on. So um, anything audio wise, Ed, that you've seen pop up? Uh, I haven't been paying that much attention. Uh, <laughs> a second. Uh, I think I've tipped in on, uh, uh, as I say, uh, the one, the one B in my bonnet, I'm going to, ri- I'm going to, going to ride this, this, this horse until it's dead and flog it a bit more. Please don't compare optical laser based mechanisms to anything that vinyl's done it's just not a it's not a sensible survival strategy um people have been light on audio questions this week i'm looking through this and um you uh someone's asked is there a receiver on the market that with at least two hdmi 2.1 ports no not as far as we know at the moment um and licensed taxman asked about whether he should go for the Denon X8500. Well, or hopefully we'll get some fair. We'll get some a bit more information from Denon on Tuesday. So I hope he's going to. Yeah, but my my argument for that would be quite straightforward. Yeah, get the, get the X8500 because that if if it's for movies particularly, um, the usual thing people say is and it's a bit of a cliche, but if you're looking for more musical stuff, Marantz, more movies, Denon. It's my take. It's normally the way it goes, and there is tuning that is done to these products, which we're going to discuss yeah. on Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have the person that actually does the tuning <laughs> on the podcast yeah, yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah, that is Tuesday, the 21st, 7 p.m. Uh, join us for a, a Denon podcast. It's it's not a sales podcast in any way, although they will be talking about a new product uh, that is coming out. It's more for your questions. It's more to discuss things like HDMI 2.1. Why do you need it? Do you need it? Uh, 4K 120 um 8K60, uh, why would you need those resolutions and frame rates? DTS uh, X Pro, what is it? 
you know, what does it do? Why is it coming along? Is it just another um, attempt at DTS to throw something at the wall and hopefully it'll stick? Or is it something that's genuinely useful and you should need, you should have it in your next uh, AVR? And I say AVR, but most of the products this year are AVCs. They are... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The tuners have gone from a lot of them. So that should be an interesting podcast. That's coming up on Tuesday, uh, like I say, 7 p.m. So uh, uh, Very quickly, very quickly, up. Gary Hall, Ed, my local Tesco's, they've got a charity sh- section. I found a magnificent Johnny Cash record from 1958 and I gave it 50p. Was it worth it because I've got a record player? Well, I mean, all things are. It, it, this now what becomes, Johnny Cash album it is really. It does. It? it does becomes a philosophical <laughs> question at this point. If you enjoy looking at them, then I fifty uh, p. There is more expensive ways of buying what is a fun, fundamentally art. Um, is most of the stuff that you can find in a charity shop investments? No. I, my firm rule with charity shops, my firm belief, and it doesn't matter whether you're buying films, books, or music, everybody gets one screaming bargain in their lives from a charity shop everybody gets one it's like spider-man i've had mine um and i'm sure that most people have also walked out of a charity shop with something they know in their heart of hearts they should have made a bigger donation for but it's not it for the most part the, the bones have been picked clean on this and unfortunately if we are staring down the barrel of a, of a recession it gets even worse people only donate stuff which they genuinely cannot be bothered to sell tragic but true uh, mr grimble any chance of nad reviews especially the t778 yeah it was supposed to arrive on friday <laughs> it didn't arrive on friday um yeah that was supposed to ar- arrive with a blue sound uh, speaker um i am waiting on those coming through uh, that will be getting reviewed um as soon as it does arrive so thanks for your question mr grimble um there's I'm Kondo sure. 007. It's not really a question, but he was the guy that mentioned um, about the Ryan Gosling Chris Evans Netflix film. It's 200 million dollars. He also said it was just surprising, given they're currently 15 billion dollars in debt, and they actually issued a, 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 a profits warning, or you know, a, a warning for the, the uh, number of um, new subscribers. Apparently, they're behind their target. And you're thinking, like, if you can't get more new subscribers during a pandemic, you got problems. <laughs> I think they're reaching market saturation. Though. If yeah, we I accept, think, think, yeah. if we accept that. Uh, I mean, what you're going to see now is a is a a much more rigorous clamping down of um, the number of uh, devices uh, that you can have per subscription. Because at the moment, let's face it, we've got people riding off each other's subs and so on and so forth. So uh, you know that's going to be uh, that that's going to be where where the I mean because they've already done the um, VPN stuff and this is the next the next thing they're going to do uh, it's the only logical way of increasing the number of subscriptions because let's face it a, a large number of people out there they've got more than one household on one subscription Phil Singh is saying uh, too many sub- streaming services uh, and I do sympathise uh, I yeah. do agree fragmentation's a big problem isn't it yeah I've got yeah. I've got stars I've got Amazon I've got Sky via Now TV uh, Netflix, Netflix Amazon Whoa, what else have I got I think I had Shudder on a trial and um, I was watching Peacock free via VBN um, but I haven't got Peacock Pro there's too much there's another yeah. thing as well there's always a the latest release uh, star studded for some of these things and you think how am I going to get to see that and um, it's on some weird service how are we going to get HBO Max Steve answer this question because I really want to see the director's Snyder cut of uh, Justice League how in the UK are we going to get HBO Max I don't know what their plans are I mean if they're not going to launch HBO Max in this country and it doesn't I haven't had anyone mention it up to now mm. um I guess what they'll do with stuff like that is either do it as a disc release in this country or they'll flog it to someone like Netflix. You think Netflix, not Sky? Mm. Well, if they do it through Sky, because it's HBO connected, yeah, that's probably more likely, which is a disaster because the quality's appalling. Yeah, really um, bad. And just you give pay me a extra. goddamn disc. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't care what you charge. I'll buy the 4K disc. 100 quid, yeah. done. 
Give me six uh, hours and 100 quid. It looks Done. like disc prices are going up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Steve. So Steve, yeah. Steve commits. <laughs> I've got to say, get a fix. That's a hell of a statement to make. Netflix is dead. Just wait another month. So you're suggesting that Netflix will be no, gone yeah. in a month? It's Netflix got problems, is, but I think it'll be around for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Netflix so. have a really good idea behind what they do. We don't like it as consumers, but the reality is, and Tom mentioned this in his thread, the reality is they just churn out new stuff and new subscribers will go, oh, look, there's this season of Cursed. I'll give it a try. Um, or they, you know, they go, there's the latest movie with the, done by the Russo brothers. I'll, I'll subscribe. That's how they get people roped in. And I think it's a model that works. It'll work a lot better for them than Disney or Apple, who have a lot of money, but who is going to subscribe? No and there's zero content. I mean, Netflix, they churn out rubbish, but people don't know it's rubbish because A, they don't read reviews, and B, they uh, just want to check out yeah, the latest. Yeah, I think the fourth most, fourth most watched, yeah, if you look at their most watched Netflix-owned produced films, like I said, Extraction is number one, but in that list, things like The Wrong Missy, which is appalling. Um, there's one of the Sandler movies with Jennifer Aniston. Six um, Underground. Six Underground. Six um, Underground. Frontier, uh, and, and, well, I mean, things like The Old Garbage are actually quite good. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of crap in there, as well as some some, some diamonds in that rough. Yeah, but, I think uh, they don't care. Yeah, because they just people... throw enough stuff at the wall, some of it'll stick. Yes, and all the people who like Michael Bay movies, like recent Michael Bay movies, I'm not talking about The Rock, there are billions of them out there. They're like, oh, yeah, I'd like to see that. How can I see it? Oh, on Netflix. Oh, I guess I'll subscribe. So they've got a pretty good model, and I think it's going to stand them better than a lot of their competitors. And it doesn't seem, it doesn't feel like with this fractured thing where you can get stars, you can get Peacock, you can get whatever, it doesn't feel like that'll affect Netflix. I'm more likely to drop Amazon or Now TV than I am to drop Netflix. Right. And it's Amazon, spot, the response Amazon is, is key. His response is that you can torrent everything. Yes, technically you can. In the no same way that, I, that I can buy Red Diesel if I really, really want to. The we the thing is, we uh, it does vary when economic situations go up and down, but there is a fixed percentage of people prepared to get stuck in and torrent things, and it generally doesn't change that highly. The idea of my parents cracking open uh, a, a, a torrent website to, to get hold of content instead of paying for just a Netflix sub is fairly unlikely. So um, yeah. it, it, it is that you're absolutely right. If you want to try, if you really want to, we've established this beyond reasonable doubt, almost anything that has been released or otherwise is available for free if you look hard enough. It's a question of how hard people are prepared to look. Yeah, I yeah. think it's a it's a it's a moot point. People who, particularly on AV, a lot of people will will get Netflix. It's not a ridiculous price. And and, and Phil's it got, it's, it's not your parents' generation, no. But it's not my generation. I, well, it's some of my generation. But in terms of just um, the effort required to look, I mean, the the last time um, I did anything involving a torrent was pursuing a DSD file of something where I'd already paid the artist for it and, and it was simply impossible to secure any other way and it's just it, it's just a, a world of your antivirus exploding like you know like a Christmas it's, it's tree it's a whole different world for most people most people just I mean kids even the kids they don't say come around my gaff and torrent and chill do they it's Netflix and chill <laughs> it's it, Netflix is fine Amazon is, will be is fine is Netflix ever involved in Netflix and chill I don't know <laughs> they may want Netflix to. are going to be fine. Amazon's yeah. always going to be fine because you're getting Amazon Prime, you're getting stuff delivered for free as well. So people get it just for that. Um, Disney, I mean, Disney, and Apple are two that because there's just so much choice now, and that's why I guess uh, Netflix is suffering from more competition than it used to because everything's fragmenting and there are streaming services all over the shop now. But there's going to be a reach a point where people can only afford so much. So they're going to, you know, start picking and choosing. So someone like Apple and someone like Disney, they're going to have to have more new content yeah um, disney or strict disney can coast for the first year as we all go back through episodes of the simpsons or finding films we've forgotten about like the black hole but eventually we're going to be like right i want something new and it better be good and they've already yeah. i've already noticed they're, they're delaying some of the uh, uh Marvel falcon stuff. winter soldiers yeah. been uh, not their fault obviously but because of covid this stuff's coming later and this stuff they need they need the mandalorian season two and they need um 
the Marvel shows because that's the only reason anyone's going to pay for that service. Pretty yes. Much. Yeah, I agree. Right, um, I think we've, we've reached the end of that point as well. Uh, don't forget, you can ask questions at any point during the week, uh, not just on the live podcast. Um, so if you're listening a little bit later in the week to the audio version or you're watching this video back and you really want to ask questions, then you can do that. Um, you can do that in the thread underneath the podcast in the uh, podcast forum at AV Forums or send a question to podcast at avforums.com on the email and we will ask them uh, and answer them. Um, in the next podcast uh, where we have time. Uh, also, if you're listening during the week, you can still sign up to patreon.com forward slash AV forums and join us for £3 a month on there if you want to be a long-term su su subscriber and supporter. Um, or if you just want to make a, a one-off, you can do that again at any point at streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums, um, which is the perfect way to ask your questions. Also, what's really important is that you hit the like button. And I can see that there's quite a number of people watching at the moment. So if you wouldn't mind, if you're enjoying this evening, show um, and we're about to move on to our final subject if you are enjoying the show please hit that like button it really does help uh, the podcast you know, when it comes to searches and popping up as suggested content and so on so we can find new listeners and viewers and members of the community and welcome them to our club uh, right so we're going to wrap up this evening with the best and worst of mr hugh jackman and first of all let's go to ed well, it's movie 43, obviously, where he's got the testicles on his chin. <laughs> <laughs> How not just did the they best... get anyone to appear in that film? I'll it's not know. just the best thing he's ever done. It's it's the single greatest cinematic moment in history. Um, oh, God. Possibly. Uh, no, uh, obviously, I have... Uh, one. Actually, our, our running order has got... Uh, can I just go... Can I just... Uh, put this to the to the crowd it's got swordfish in the worst now swordfish is not a good film it's close to guilty pleasure but it's tremendously it's like one of my guilty pleasures yeah yeah it's, it's close to guilty pleasure yeah. hang on hang on the running order is cars put these in the it's, i just put them in there yes yeah. Well, I, I, uh, yes you're right uh, no one is ever going to talk about the critical merit of swordfish um but um, I think it's, I, it's difficult, Ed. I used to do uh, programming, and I watched Swordfish, and I saw Hugh Jackman the, the with a glass of red wine and three or four computers standing up, going, yes, 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 no, 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 while splicing code together like he was on drugs, but it was actually just wine. And it looked the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. You're saying that um, that's, that's the most ridiculous hacking scene and not the one with the laptop and the lady? No, I thought... Uh, I, that's yeah, funny. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's... that's <laughs> I mean, I particularly the way he's doing it wirelessly over the club network. I mean, because, you know, yeah, we all I mean, know that they go lightning fast. It's def definitely a guilty pleasure. I mean, just for John Travolta's... Well, it's not just beard. that. My, fa my favourite is... I mean, so it's got a TVR Tuscan in it, which has still got its UK registration plates on because they thought they looked exotic. Only you would notice that. Only no, no, no. So, so, so it's in the oh, trivia well. thing for um, for but uh, no, I it's I, I it's not his best work, but nevertheless, I I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, the best work was the last Wolverine film he did, with yes. C.R. Uh, Patrick I, Stewart, which I I can't actually remember the name of it. But Logan, uh, it's top of my list. Uh, well, okay, shows how much attention I've been paying. I I in terms of actual acting chops, I thought that was good. But he's good. He's been good value whenever he's got his claws out. Um, so that's fine. I haven't watched The Greatest Showman. Um, it's I love The Greatest Showman. I do. Just, yeah, it's just just, one just, one just a uh, uh, just a, a simple awesome disc too. Four K D I absolutely yeah. gorgeous, fantastic soundtrack, and the music, the songs are brilliant. Yeah. Almost every song in that musical is a cracker. Yes, so but I've heard every song. I don't yeah, need on the to radio. watch. <laughs> no, no, not on the radio. Remember? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So I on I've vinyl. Heard... Oh no, no. I've heard, on I've piano. Heard... <laughs> On piano with someone singing along badly mainly um so yeah i don't need to watch that um one of the weirdest things that i watched him in and i did weirdly enjoy was kate leopold i oh, did God. kind of i thought that was weirdly charming but um for the most part he's done his best work whilst being wolverine he has but he also did x-men origins wolverine which, which is, is his about. is bad it's a bad. It a bad oh, yes, but if you do it enough, if you do it, it enough times, it will be be crap. Uh, You'll produce something crap. 
Maybe. I know what you mean. Uh, certainly Logan is fantastic. I, I also thought he, he was pretty good in The Prestige, particularly since I, I didn't really... Yeah, I didn't it's like really his great. character that much, and I well, probably... Well, it's a difficult role, too, because he's playing two people, basically. Yes, yes. Or someone pretending to be something else half the time, yeah. and you don't realise it, but then you do it at the end, and it's it's, it's great yeah. fun. And he's yeah, also... Him... I, wa I watched it last week. He's brilliant. And he's really good in Prisoners. He is, yeah. So th those were the ones that I put in as my top three. I know, Phil. Ju it's just my opinion. I, I just I just put them in as suggestions. And they're listed as musicals because if you like musicals, he's done some really good musicals. Uh, and then I did put Wolverine, uh, X-Men Origins Wolverine, just to be clear, because I actually like the Wolverine movie. The Wolverine, all open. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I put Pan and I put Swordfish in worst, although when writing the word Swordfish, it made me put down guilty pleasure. So I, I, it clearly should go in the guilty pleasure section, which I put Van Helsing in because it's an absolutely appalling movie. <laughs> but it's Kate Beckinsale and it's Hugh Jackman. and it's, You can sort of tell that both of them know that they're in yeah, the midst of something really... which is not terribly good and they're just going to make the best of it. Yeah, they're, they're, these are pretty bad movies, but they are actually quite entertainingly bad. So, so I'd probably shift those two to, to a guilty pleasure. Phil Singh says, don't think Hugh Jackman has a big enough uh, back catalogue for me compared to previous actors from previous weeks. Phil, uh, he was voted for by our patrons. We just do what if, we if you want to change the outcome of these votes, then you could sign up and become a patron at patreon.com forward slash AV forums, um, where they vote for which actor we're going to talk about or which subject we're going to talk about at the end. Um, so if you want to become involved in that and um, basically <laughs> make up the running order for the week or, <laughs> and force us to talk about it, then uh, you can do that um, because I can't think of any Hugh Jackman other than what's been in Kazi's list. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, I've just remembered one looking at the list there I quite enjoyed, Real Steel. Yes, I that, did. That's yeah, a guilty I pleasure. Did. <laughs> I did. I try to stick to three for most of those. Yeah, I can, and also I, could, um, I did I enjoy me Eddie the Eagle as well. <laughs> I haven't seen Eddie the Eagle yet, it's but fun. I've, I've heard good things. Yes, yes. And okay, when, I, I did like saying, his incredibly short run in uh, the, the. Isn't it, it literally? He's in X Men: Days of Future Past for about. Uh, no, one expletive. No, sorry, sorry. X. Uh, is it, first is it class. First, first class. class for about, got a great cameo in first class. Yeah. It, that's a magnificent, magnificent. Uh, one uh, swear word and done. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so all we need to do now is podcast competition, Kaz. Sure. Our podcast exclusive con competition is for Fantasy Island on Blu-ray. To select the right answer, you need to use the following question. Who played the host in the original 70s Fantasy Island TV series? There you go. Boom. Go. Okay. You I'll can do that. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, get entered in, Steve, because you're loud. Um, I'm not right. Um, I think that's about it for the podcast this week. Um, thanks again to Ken for uh, his three pound donation. That is really appreciated. And don't forget, you can uh, send us questions, make whoa, donations. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Was, there, was there was there a question from Ken that we didn't see? <laughs> no, there was not a question <laughs> no, this week. Good. Okay. Just... No. And when as soon as we started talking about uh, Hugh Jackman, I did check where licensed taxi man. He hasn't been in the back of his taxi either. So we've cleared up those things this week. But like I say, if you've got questions, you want to make donations any point during the week uh, when you listen to the podcast or at any point when you listen or watch the podcast, then you can do that. And you can also send your question to podcast at avforums.com email address. But that's it for this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. Is this Canada? Ed Selly. Real should be a very fluid concept for you right now. Hello. And Kaz, hello. Second to the right and straight on till morning. Uh, if you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a like. It really is important. And uh, there's still lots of you watching. So if you haven't hit the like button yet, then please do that. And also, while you're here, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, then please do subscribe and click the notification bell on the YouTube channel so you don't miss anything that we publish uh, coming up in the very near future, our product reviews. So you want to see those. Um, and also the comparisons, they'll be coming up soon as well. So make sure you hit the notification bell after subscribing. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews news and videos and plus you can leave us a five star rating on itunes uh, but only if you enjoyed the show i'm phil hinton thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening and we'll see you again next week mm -hmm.